can be seated. So we're continuing to make our way through the Lord's Prayer. This is number two out of three sermons in this brief series where we look at the prayer that Tertullian, one of the ancient church fathers, called the epitome of the gospel. And I think we found last week that he wasn't joking. In the first two words alone, we find the whole of the gospel summarized, and that gold just keeps coming as we mine this prayer this week and next week. And the reason we're looking at this is because prayer isn't optional for Christians. Prayer is not something that some of us do and others don't. It's not listed on any of the lists of spiritual gifts that are given to some to do with excellence and for others to leave for the others to do with excellence. Uh, When we use the body metaphor, it's not something only hearts or uh, voices do while hands do other and different work. Prayer is essential And it's more like breathing. It's something the whole body needs to do in order to live. And while there are things that can cause deficiencies of breathing, there's no such thing as breathing excellently. You don't ever compliment someone on being a great breather, right? It's something we all need to be doing. And the Lord's Prayer is what Jesus leaves us in order to teach us this most important task. And so I hope that you've been praying the Lord's Prayer with us daily. We challenged you last week to join into that new habit, to pray once a day at least this Lord's Prayer, maybe with others, maybe by yourself, maybe just these words, maybe using them to enter more deeply into prayers. The important thing is that you pray and pray this prayer because more will come from that new habit in a couple weeks than from listening to any of these sermons. Let's, though, turn to hearing those words and to listening to Jesus as he teaches us to pray, pausing first to pray that God would speak. So let's pray together. Lord, it's in your light that we see light. It's in your truth that we find freedom and in your way that we find peace. So come and shine upon us, we pray, that we might see you more clearly and follow after. In your name we pray, amen. Do whatever you need to do to listen well to these words from the book that beats to the heart of God. When you pray, Don't pour out a flood of empty words as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they'll be heard. Don't be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as it's done in heaven. Give us the bread we need for today. Forgive us for the ways we've wronged you as we forgive those who have wronged us. And don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So last week we looked at the first six words, the address tells us to whom we're praying, our Father who art in heaven. The rest of the prayer is split up into six petitions. We ask this God to do six things. It's important to learn that prayer is about what God is doing and not about what we do. But the structure even of these six petitions tells us something else important about prayer. The first three of these petitions are all about what God is doing. We call these the divine petitions. That's what we'll look at today. And the last three are about us, the human petitions. Prayer is absolutely the place we go to ask God for what we need. Jesus tells us that a number of times in the Gospels. But the prayer that Jesus gives us is actually concerned first with who God is and what God wants. 
We could do a whole sermon just on this if we tried to fully unpack what that means. That prayer is not first and foremost about how we get what we want out of God, but about how we get in on what God wants. Prayer is about our being and becoming in the light of God. And so we attend to God first, to God's name, to God's kingdom, to God's will, before then attending to ourselves. And as we do that and look at those three divine petitions today, we're going to learn three things, see three things about prayer and about what it is to be human in light of God. The first one is that the earth matters. The second is that worship is central. And the third is that things are not as they should be. So the first is that the earth matters. The last little bit of these first three petitions is what some have called the hinge in the Lord's Prayer. What brings us from those first three to the last three. It's thought by most scholars to have to do with all three of these petitions on earth as it is in heaven. That's about the hallowing of God's name. That's about God's kingdom coming and God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. In Greek, it's actually the other way around. As it is in heaven, so may it be on earth. And I think this is actually the core of the whole prayer and maybe the essence of all prayer. As it is in heaven, may it be on earth. Which means that the earth matters because praying is earth-centered. As Christians, we're not those who are trying to get out of here trying to leave all of this behind, biding our time until we die and our souls can escape from the prison of the flesh and this world to get out of here. No, we're praying that as it is on heaven, may it be on earth. We're taught to pray that the earth may be made into heaven's image. We're praying for the earth, for all of creation, for all of this world, so all of this must matter. And last fall, when we walked through the book of Revelation, when we looked at that together, we discovered that really that whole book is about the, this part of the prayer, on earth as it is in heaven. How is it that that will be so? How will God's will be done and God's kingdom come? Well, the book of Revelation tells us, and at the end of that book, we find this prayer answered in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. Of course, the wind is going to make this tough for me. This is John's vision, the answer to this prayer. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne say, See, God's dwelling is here with humankind. He will dwell with them and they will be his peoples. God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the former things have passed away. Heaven is going to come to earth, and both are going to be renewed and united, such that God is no longer in heaven, but dwelling here among us, wiping every tear from our eyes, making everything new. That's what we're praying toward. The world matters to our praying because the world matters to God. We're not just trying to get out of here, but actually praying for heaven to come here. And these prayers, if we're praying them right, are also not just internal and individualistic, but global. We don't pray as it is in heaven, may it be in my own heart. We're praying that God's doing would be done throughout the world. And as we pray this over and over again, we're trained and habitualized to join into that work. Last week I taught you a Latin phrase, communio sanctorum, the communion of saints. 
Well, this week we have a new Latin phrase, missio dei, mission of God, God's mission. God's mission is to the world, and God's whole existence is focused in on this mission throughout history to come to the world and restore all things. We hear about it in one of my favorite scripture passages, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, that God in Christ is reconciling the world to himself. And Paul goes on to say, and is now giving us the ministry of reconciliation. That what God is doing is working to restore and redeem and reconcile all things in all the world to himself through Jesus. And he's making us to join into that work with him. Which means that the world matters. The things of this earth matter. We're joined into God's mission as we're joined into Christ and call, are called to work for the kingdom that heaven may come to earth. And that means that this isn't just important for your neighbor, but for your neighborhood and for the way people relate to one another, and the way that that whole system functions. That it doesn't just matter for your job and what you do, but also for the culture in your office, for the atmosphere in your school. It all matters. These are all places where God is bringing heaven to earth, and we are being invited to join into that work. We are praying that what's so in heaven, where God's name is hallowed, where God's kingdom rules and God's will is done, that all of this may be so to the ends of the earth, which means the earth matters right here around us and to its very ends. The first thing we see is that the earth matters. Amen? The second is that worship is central. Hallowed be thy name, we pray. And learn, maybe surprisingly, that God has a name, that God is not an idea or a concept, but a personal being with a name. In Exodus 3 in the Old Testament, that name is given to Moses out of the burning bush, the personal unique name of God revealed and carrying God's essence and being within it. Yahweh, I am who I am. We learn too that that name is holy, that it's set apart. Moses is told to take off his sandals for the ground upon which he stands is holy. In the Ten Commandments, we're told to keep that name holy by not making it vain, by not profaning it. And one of the most important tasks for our lives is learning to deal with God as God is. Not as we want God to be, not as we think God should be, not as the world tells us God is, but learn to deal with God as God really is. And what we learn by praying this prayer is that God has a name and God's name is holy, set apart, weighty, glorious. And the only way to deal with such a God is in worship. Our brothers and sisters who are Presbyterian give us the gift of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Its first question and answer is this. What is the chief end of man? What's the purpose of humanity? What is the highest goal towards which we can strive as human beings? And it answers this way. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Worship is the proper posture of humanity and indeed of all creation. Augustine in his memoir, Confessions, said it this way, You made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Hallowed be thy name. The proper posture of our lives is worship. And we could paraphrase this prayer in some ways like this. May the true nature of your name be made known to the ends of the earth as it's known in heaven so that creation itself might respond appropriately and join the praise that goes on in heaven even now. It's the picture we see in Philippians 2 that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Worship is central 
This is our primary posture in life as beings made by God. Those who've come to know God's name and that it is holy, we worship. And we pray for God to continue to hallow that name that the world may know and enter in as well. Worship is central. The earth matters. Worship is central. And the world is not as it should be. It's easy to get comfortable in the world as it is. We live here. We breathe this air. It's where we spend all of our time. It's easy to begin to assume that this is home, that this is all there is, and this is as it should be. In the last year, we've had a bit of a wake-up call with a pandemic, with all of the other turmoil in politics and in our culture, to see maybe this isn't the way that it should be. But that fact shouldn't be a surprise to Christians because as those who've learned to pray this prayer, we are those who know that this is not the way the world should be. As we pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done, we remember that there's another kingdom ruling here. We remember that God's will is not currently being done in the world. And we acknowledge that the world lives in rebellion against the will of its true king. See, the world in which we live is not a neutral place. It's not a level pitch on which the actions of our lives take place. This is a rebellious kingdom in which we are held captive. To pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done means then to take a stand in the fight. It means to pick a side in the battle. And as we do so, on the one end, what we learn to do is give up our own will, learning that it too is held captive, that it too is broken and twisted, and that we do not want what we ought to want. And so in praying this prayer, we learn to give up our will and desire what God desires and want what God wants. That's not an easy task. We know what we want and we want it. One of the things we hear often in our house is, but I want it. And that's Sam and I talking, not (laughs) Hannah and Owen. This is part of what it means to die to ourselves. We die to our will, to what we want and how we want it and when we want it. And we learn to surrender to God. Jesus is teaching us to pray what he himself would later pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. Facing his arrest and torture and execution, he prays, Father, not my will, but yours be done. One of the things it means to plant a flag and take a side is to learn to give up our own will. But it also means to pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God and then join the insurgency. To pray your kingdom come is to welcome the true king to return and take his place on the throne, is to say with the earliest Christians in the earliest creed, Jesus is Lord, which means Caesar's not, and neither is any other king or president or nation or party, that Jesus is Lord and king, and we pick a side when we pray your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. A kingdom unlike any other kingdom we've known or seen. A kingdom, finally, that doesn't revolve around power and force and violence. Because this is the king who rules from the cross. From the cross on which he gives his life as a ransom for many. This is the king that we serve. This is the kingdom that we welcome when we say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The world is not as it should be. And we are praying for God to invade. We're praying for God's kingdom of peace and hope and love that it might break through into the midst of this world in which we live. We're praying for God's will, for healing and flourishing and reconciliation to burst into our lives and relationships. We believe that that kingdom gained its foothold in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And we believe that a day will come when that kingdom will fully come in a day we hear about then in Revelation 19, 11 through 16. It's another passage we looked at this past fall. 
a passage I probably won't ever see quite the same way. And I want you to really hone in on this picture because this is the picture that sits behind our praying of the Lord's Prayer. Then I saw heaven opened and there was a white horse and its rider is called Faithful and True and he judges and makes war justly. His eyes are like a fiery flame and on his head are many royal crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. And he wore a robe dyed with blood and his name is called the Word of God. And heaven's armies, wearing fine linen that's white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword that he will use to strike down the nations. He's the one who will rule them with an iron rod. And he is the one who will trample the winepress of almighty God's passionate anger. He has a name written on his robe and on his thigh. King of kings and Lord of lords. And as the scene unfolds, he and his army destroy the beast and the dragon and Satan himself handily, crushing all the evil and darkness of this world and bringing God's kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. Is that the picture that you have in mind when you pray the Lord's Prayer? The rider on the white horse whose name is, who is called Faithful and True? That's what we're praying toward when we join our voices in these words. We are praying for God to come and make God's name known. We are praying for Jesus to come as judge and to make war justly, to right wrongs and sort everything out, to bring God's kingdom by destroying all of God's enemy, the beast, the dragon, Satan, and to do God's will by establishing peace and justice and ruling forever. That's what we pray for in a world that is not as it should be. That as it is in heaven, may it be so on earth as well. That God might act. That God might come. That God would sort out all that's wrong on earth. That God would reconcile our broken relationships. That God would heal our broken bodies. That God would wipe every tear from our eyes that the world would know the name of Jesus, the name they were made to worship, and at his name, bow in worship. That's the scope of this prayer. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Let's pray and we'll respond in song. Lord, you are able to do this because you are almighty God. And you are ready and willing because you are faithful Father. So God, come into the darkness of this world and of our lives. May your name be hallowed. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. Lord, right all that is wrong. Destroy all that is evil. Shine light into darkness and come to embrace us with your love and your grace. Lord, come in all the power of your kingdom into our lives and all the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.